Welcome. Welcome to another session of Talks at Pulitzer, the online series featuring the journalist grantees of the Pulitzer Center. I'm John Sawyer, the founder and director uh, of the Pulitzer Center. We'll be focusing today on The Call, the new book by Pulitzer grantee, critic of Arger on Saudi Arabia's role in the rise of fundamentalist Islamist movements around the globe. Helping us lead the discussion is Bruce Rydell, Senior Fellow and Director of the Brookings Intelligence Project at the Brookings Institution here in Washington. More on Critica and Bruce uh, in a, just a moment, but first some information on us uh, and some housekeeping details. Now, while we're waiting for more, more folks to join us, uh, let us know in the chat where, you, where you're calling from, where you're listening in from, what cities and countries uh, you're from. The Pulitzer Center started out in 2006, supporting nine projects. Last year, we approved more than 180 from professional journalists and 43 uh, reporting fellows from our campus consortium partner universities completed projects in 43 countries. I'm sorry, 29 countries. On the education front, we reach thousands of students and educators each year via class visits, online lessons, teacher professional development workshops and university events uh, with our journalist grantees and education staff. And then of course there are public events uh, like today's session. Uh, for more information on our journalism and education programs, uh, visit PulitzerCenter.org. So let's see, on the chat, let me see where folks are coming in from. We've got uh, Baltimore, we've got Hamburg, Germany, we've got Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, that's very appropriate for today. We've got Madrid, Spain, uh, the United Kingdom, um, from Maine, Washington, Cambridge, Mass, New York City, uh, Fairfax, Virginia, uh, lots of folks from all over. Uh, so we really appreciate all of you being here and we look forward to your questions and the, and the conversation. So just a few house, uh, housekeeping matters before we start. Uh, we've asked Critica to make brief opening remarks, just four or five minutes, uh, and then we'll turn to Bruce uh, for his reflections on the book as a whole, and then to follow up with additional questions to Critica. Uh, I'll have some of my own, I'm sure, and along the way, we'll also present some poll questions to you if we have time, highlighting some of the themes of the book, and hopefully teasing out your own views and interests too. We're going to hold the event to an hour max and want to reserve as much time as possible for your questions. You'll see on the Zoom chat at the bottom, maybe at this point we're all getting used to Zoom, but at the bottom, you know, if you scroll there, you'll see a Q&A icon. Uh, you can begin adding your questions there throughout the remarks. Uh, please go ahead and do that as we're talking. Uh, they'll come to us and we'll curate them and pull from those you know, as we proceed and address as many as we can. There's also, <clears throat> also a chat icon on the, on the screen, and we'd appreciate if you'd use that for specific technology issues. If it's not working, if you're not hearing Critica or Bruce or me, uh, put a note there, and, and Holly Pippenberg, my colleague who's producing this, will we'll try to address it. Um, you'll note that all of you are muted, uh, but if you can't hear us, do let us know. But specific questions should go into the Q&A box, because that's where we'll be pulling from those from the Q&A box. Uh, we want to let you know that we are recording uh, the session today, so we can post it online for those uh, who weren't able to join us today, but can see it in the future. And this one final housekeeping matter, uh, please remember to stay online uh, once the session ends, just to participate in a very brief survey would help us better serve uh, your interest as we do more of these events in the days ahead. For now, please again welcome uh, Kritika Varga and Bruce Rydell. Kritika has been the Indonesia correspondent for The Guardian and Financial Times. Uh, she's written for major news, news outlets throughout the world. Uh, she was a recipient of several Pulitzer Center grants for reporting on Saudi influence in Southeast Asia and in the Balkans. Her first book, The Call, Inside the Global Saudi Religious Project, was published this month by Columbia Global Reports. Uh, we're so glad to have you with us, uh, Kritika, today. And also Bruce uh, Rydell, a distinguished scholar on Saudi Arabia himself, a 30-year veteran of the Central Intelligence Agency who served as senior advisor on South Asia and the Middle East uh, to the last four presidents of the United States. So Critica, we'll begin with you and then hear from Bruce 
uh, what is the central message of the call? And what did you learn by focusing your reporting on the highly diverse countries of Indonesia, Nigeria, and Kosovo? Thank you so much for that intro, John. Um, so I was seven years old on 9-11 and uh, on a day when famously 15 of the 19 hijackers who attacked the Twin Towers were from Saudi Arabia. I lived most of my life during the so-called war on terror, where a lot of reading the news, reading about extremism, fundamentalism, often you came across this concept of Saudi money, Saudi influence, petro-Islam, Wahhabization of the world. Um, if any of you guys, I'm sure, um, read the news, you two have come across this kind of phrasing. And then when I was 22, I moved to Indonesia to work as a journalist. It's the world's largest Muslim majority country and the fourth largest country in the world. It's on the other side of the world, so much so that it's 12 hours ahead of us, so it's night and day. Um, and as soon as I started reporting there, too, on religion and politics, which is what I'm mostly interested in, I started hearing this Indonesian word, Arabisasi, uh, or Arabization, which was this idea that a lot of the things I was reporting on there, from suicide bombings to foreign fighters joining ISIS, to uh, the rise of political Islam in a democratic country, were all attributable to Saudi influence. I thought this was pretty interesting and I was new enough to the country that I followed every lead on everything, not just about Saudi money. But Saudi money quickly proved to be the most interesting thing I was looking into. This was back in 2016. Because again, in Indonesia, everyone was talking about it and no one really knew what it meant. I would say, what do you mean Saudi Arabia has changed Indonesia? They'd be like, oh, they, you know, people wear hijabs because of Saudi Arabia now. I was like, that couldn't possibly be true. How could that country do that? Um, but in, in order to find out what Saudi money really did in the world's largest Muslim majority country, um, I looked to the Pulitzer Center and they funded my first reporting project on Saudi proselytization in Indonesia and Southeast Asia. Pretty soon after I started reporting on what this meant, which included scholarships, universities, mosques, person-to-person um, -person relationships, pilgrimages, a lot of stuff, um, I realized it was really a global project. And what we were really looking at was not Saudi money in America or Saudi creating terrorists or whatever. It was a six decade long campaign from the country that was the birthplace of Islam to spread its brand of Islam in the Muslim world. And the Muslim world, keep in mind, is not just the Middle East. It's more than a billion people and it stretches from Europe to Africa to Asia. So I thought, given that the ambition and the size and scope of this project, the fact that there wasn't much written about it recently, and so much of what I was finding was new, um, I decided to write a book about it. And I did want to take the, this very large and diverse Muslim world um, at that scope. So I decided to expand my lens from Indonesia to Nigeria, which is the most uh, populous Muslim majority country in Africa. And then also a very interesting other case study in the Balkans. Kosovo is the youngest population in Europe. It's from the com former communist Yugoslavia, and it's about 98% Muslim today. Um, so, you know, looking at these three countries, I learned what the Saudi religious project was like. It started in the 1960s and really skyrocketed in the 1970s once Saudi oil money, um, oil revenues exploded after the embargo of the Arab-Israeli war. Um, and you know, something I try to emphasize is not just that they had this oil money, it's that they had oil money and they had this accurate descriptor as the birthplace of Islam. Every Muslim every day prays in the direction of the Kaaba, the shrine in Mecca. It's where the Prophet Muhammad is from, it's where the first Muslims were. And the Saudi king, his title is not, you know, his royal highness, it's the custodian of the two holiest mosques in Islam. So it's this combination of factors, um, this, this huge oil boom, rise in revenue, this ambitious project, and the fact that they were the birthplace of the religion that gave birth to this really unique phenomenon. So some of the um, effects of Saudi terrorism might be familiar to you. 
They do include, sorry, Saudi export of fundamentals might be familiar to you. They do include terrorism in some extreme fringe minorities. Um, Saudi investments have funded jihadi training camps. They have funded schools that have been home to jihadi circles. Um, they, you know, Saudi charities have even directly funded branches of Al Qaeda in the past. But that's really not the only thing that I looked at. And it was really, in, in deep fact, it was like the tip of the iceberg. Um, they also created, in many countries, a class of Salafi fundamentalist clerics who became very influential in Sharia or Sharia-inspired laws in countries like Nigeria. Um, they also created this current of intolerance against minorities like Shia Muslims and Ahmadiyya Muslims and other religions like Christianity. Um, and they also, ironically, helped in a lot of places political Islam. Even though Saudi Arabia today is somewhat against Islamism, in countries like Indonesia, they helped influential Islamist political parties come together. So all of these things arose from the Saudi Dawah project. And Dawah means the call, it's the title of my book, it means the call or invitation to Islam. Um, it means a whole range of proselytization activities. And um, you know, if you take, if you remember anything from my talk, you should know that Dawah is not just one thing. It comes from a lot of different places. It comes from the Saudi government, it comes from Saudi charities, it comes from Saudi business people, sometimes working together, but often not. It's a very diverse, loosely grouped project. Um, so when you when you when we talk about Saudi money, we have to keep all of this in mind. It's not a one direction relationship because it doesn't even come from one place. Um, Saudi Arabia does have a dedicated Dawa ministry, which is a proselytization ministry that oversees a lot of such some of these activities in 24 different countries. In some of these countries, Saudi Arabia has a religious attaché which is kind of a deputy to the ambassador who's in charge of Islamic stuff. Uh, this is the case in Indonesia, which has one of the most extensive apparatuses. Um, but yeah, it's really a mixed bag. And that's why I am really happy to have looked at it on the ground. Um, finally, something very important to know is that this ambitious project has peaked. It peaked at least 10 years ago, arguably 20 years ago. Um, two things happened. First of all, oil revenues dipped and you know there's not as much money going around. Second of all, the Saudi brand started to carry a lot of baggage after 9-11. Um, during the Cold War, the US and Saudi Arabia were very close partners. We had a lot of common interests in countries from Egypt to Somalia to Afghanistan. Um, America was fighting communism, the Soviet style, and Saudi was fighting Arab socialism and the Iranian revolution. But after 9-11, uh, first of all, the Cold War was over, so we didn't have that in common anymore. But then this idea of Islamic terrorism became impossible to ignore. It became the dominant foreign policy you know, obsession of the West, definitely America. So it was no longer possible for Saudi charity to go to a country like Kosovo during wartime and send imams and preachers there because the Saudi brand started to have so much baggage. So for all those reasons, it's important to be realistic about what the project is today, which is much diminished than it was at its peak in the 80s. That being said, I think the legacy effects of the project are voluminous. It's not a history that I wrote, it's a current affairs book. Um, Saudi influence in a lot of these post-colonial countries, especially in Asia and Africa, means that Salafism and fundamental Islam is there to stay in almost all those countries. It's not it, it, it's not the only thing there, you know, Saudi Arabia is not, I don't like the, I don't like to use the idea of corrupting a country's traditions, but they have permanently added this sector to the religious landscape. So if you go to any of these countries today from Asia to Africa to even parts of Europe, you will find some section of their religious landscape to include Salafis. And a lot, a large part of that is because of Saudi influence. So, you know, given that Saudi Arabia has had such a, an incredible impact on the Muslim world. And given that they're such a valued partner of the US to this day, um, I think it's really important to understand what they've done, what they're doing, and how it's changing. 
Great. <clears throat> Bruce, do you want to unmute and, and speak to the, your thoughts on the book and questions for Critica? Sure. Can you hear me OK? Um, first of all, it's a fabulous book. Uh, it's very well written. Uh, you will, I think, find it once you start into it, uh, you really can't put it down. Uh, there's a great number of characters, organizations, um, uh, lots of things uh, that really are fascinating. It also fills a peculiar niche. Um, as Kritika said, uh, it's now almost 20 years since 9-11. Uh, since we've had a lot of books about Al-Qaeda. We've had a lot of books about Osama bin Laden. We've had books about Islam, political Islam, Salafism, terrorism. All of those books talk about Saudi money and talk about Saudi influence, but until this one, no one has actually done a very thorough job of just what are the Saudis up to? What have they been doing over time? What are the institutions of the Saudi state and also of the Saudi clerical establishment that are involved in these things? Uh, so it's very important. This is a, a path-breaking book, and I, I congratulate Krithka on uh, putting it together. The, um, the Saudis uh, have always had one advantage um, since the 1920s in exporting their version of Islam, which is, of course, uh, as she said, they are the custodian of the two holy mosques, which means that the Islamic pilgrimage uh, to Mecca and Medina uh, brings literally millions of people now every year to the kingdom. And allows the kingdom to expose all of these people uh, to the Saudi way of thought, the Wahhabi uh, culture. Um, it's important to remember that the Hajj is not just, the pilgrimage is not just the so-called Hajj, uh, which takes place once a year. The pilgrimage goes on every day of the year. It's interesting today, of course, that the pilgrimage is shut because of the coronavirus and the Hajj, which should be taking place at the end of July this year, uh, the Saudis have already more or less said is not going to take place. So one of the key mechanisms by which a Wahhabi Islam is propagated in the world is at least for the foreseeable future uh, turned off. And of course, the second element, which is so important to the effectiveness of Saudi proselytization, oil money, uh, is more turned off now. Uh, we've never seen oil prices as low as they are today. Uh, Saudi oil uh, this weekend was trading on the Gulf market for $12 a barrel. Um, Saudi Arabia needs it to be traded at about $85 a barrel to pay its budget. So there's going to be a substantial decline, uh, much more than there already has been uh, in Saudi Arabia's ability to export uh, its version of Islam. The Saudis, though, remain, remain as steadfast on some points. And one of the most steadfast points is they still propagate militantly against Shiism. And certainly the war in Yemen, uh, which is today the world's worst humanitarian crisis, is largely about Sunni acrimony towards Shias uh, and towards Iran, uh, but in general towards Shias across the board. One last thing I would like to make point I would like to make about the book, which I found quite fascinating, is the Saudis are and have been good at putting their idea out. But they're not very good at managing the groups that take that idea um, and start running with it on its own. Um, Saudi bureaucracy just seems to be unable to keep control of the groups that it helps to propagate. Uh, Al-Qaeda, of course, is, is the best example of this. Uh, Al-Qaeda uh, was very much nurtured uh, with Saudi money. Um, Osama bin Laden is, of course, a Saudi. Uh, but pretty quickly, uh, by the late 1990s, the Saudis had more or less lost control of Al-Qaeda completely. And in 2006 and 2007, it came home to haunt them. Uh, with attacks inside Riyadh and may, many other uh, Saudi cities. Part of the process by which the Saudis began to rethink the whole logic of supporting the call. Um, I would like to just ask one question, uh, which is, 
Can you say a little bit more about uh, Saudi efforts in the Balkans, in Kosovo, uh, and how those ran parallel, if you like, uh, to American interests in also trying to um, uh, alter the trajectory of the Balkans uh, in the Yugoslav Wars? Um, something that is really interesting that I heard a lot in Kosovo was, well, first of all, when you go to the Balkans, it is the end of the American century. It ended there. It was, it was remarkable. I'd never been anywhere with so many fingerprints of, um, you know, American, uh, the interventions that ended a lot of the wars there in Bosnia and Kosovo specifically. In Kosovo, there's so much that there's like a huge statue of Bill Clinton in downtown Pristina, and there's a Richard Holbrook Boulevard and all this stuff. So America was very fundamental to the national characters of these states. But at the same time, the, uh, the US presence and the UN presence, of which America was a big part, didn't look to the spiritual or religious aspects of rebuilding these communities. Um, even though part of the trauma of the wars was not only had they been in this kind of communist, uh, anti-religious state, which was Yugoslavia, but during the war in Kosovo, for example, the Serbs used minarets and mosques as target practice and targeted religious leaders for murder. So this was unbelievably traumatic and it was not really on the radar of Americans or the UN inter inter um, you know, intermediary commission there. So the Gulf Charities found a very easy thing to minister to by providing imams, Qurans, textbooks, and rebuilding the mosques, even if some of them were ugly and not in this beautiful Ottoman style that used to be there, they were at least doing something rather than nothing. So for a long time, you know, until the scrutiny was dialed up uh, a few years ago, um, the Saudi charities seemed to be completely complementary to American rebuilding efforts in Kosovo. Um, the other thing that I want to draw out as a dynamic in the Balkans was that in a lot of cases, Saudi had kind of trained its fo focus from Afghanistan to the Balkans. So right as the Af Soviet-Afghan war was wi winding up, um, and for those of you who don't know, this was a pretty long, you know, decade-long war where the U.S. and Saudi Arabia teamed up funded the Afghan Mujahideen guerrillas for about $3 billion uh, it, against the Soviet Union. As that was winding down, the Yugoslavia was dissolving. So a lot of the Saudi charities had this infrastructure. They knew how to raise money within the kingdom. They knew how to raise money from the Islamic world. Um, and they even knew how to recruit foreign fighters to fight for their Muslim brothers. So they kind of grafted this apparatus onto Bosnia where one of the main dynamics among many was Muslims versus Orthodox versus you know, Christians. So the Bosnia Jihad was a place where a lot of Mujahideen went. And then after Bosnia, Kosovo was kind of the last stand. So something I write in my book was that the Kosovo relief effort, which was started in December, 1998, was the last big Saudi uh, international project before 9-11. After 9-11, everything changed. They could never do something like this again. But in 98 and 99, they had the Saudi Commission for Kosovo Relief, which uh, was in place until, I want to say, 2005. Um, and it proved incredibly influential, again, because the UN and the US weren't even looking at what they were doing, which was spreading Salafi Islam, giving scholarships to Saudi Arabia, rebuilding mosques, giving cash handouts to fundamentalist clerics, and so on. So today there's a thriving Salafi ecosystem in Kosovo, which is pretty amazing because it was such a, not even moderate, but unreligious country before this. And it kind of happened under everyone else's noses. You know, one point on that, uh, Kretika, that and this might be a good point, Holly, to do one of our poll questions is sort of looking at the repercussions of some of these things and unintended consequences. Maybe, Holly, we could do the poll on the, the source of fighters, um, jihadists coming from Europe. Can we pull that poll up? So in which European country accounted for the largest number per capita of recruits for ISIS? And of course, now we're talking about 2013, 14, 15, much later, but the consequence of that. And so you look at the across Europe, France, Kosovo, United Kingdom, and if you all could just, you know, those on the call, just put in your, your choice. Where, where do you think the largest number per capita uh, came from? And we'll, we'll count down here just five, four, three, 
uh, two, uh, one, and uh, see what, what kind of results we got. So, uh, Kritika, you might speak to that. You know, maybe 55% say Kosovo. Um, um, that was the correct answer. Um, all good guesses. Um, but Kosovo actually had eight times the number of jihadists per capita as France, which was the second highest. Of course, France is a bigger country, so absolute numbers are bigger, but Kosovo is a country of two million people with about, you know, hundreds of people who joined ISIS. And that was pretty remarkable. And how did this young population, the youngest in Europe, ever become susceptible to these ideas or feel part of a global Islamic community? Uh, in large part, it was because of the Saudi charities that went there. And it's a, it's a really tricky uh, gray area, similar to the one Saudi Arabia also faces. The imams who were educated in Saudi Arabia were not necessarily telling them to become jihadists. In some cases, they were you know, talking only about like the inhumanity of Bashar al-Assad, which we can, I think, all agree on. But at the same time, these preachers who were mostly educated in Medina, the second holiest city in Islam, purposely blurred the lines between what's your duty, whether you should fight, and what it means to be a good Muslim. And uh, they were all Salafis. And um, eventually, it was impossible to arrest any of them because it was hard to prove that they had done anything wrong. Although it's obvious that they have, you know, kind of corrupted a whole generation of dissolute young people in their country. Uh, it's exactly the same dynamic that you see in Saudi Arabia today, where the kingdom does not actually promote jihadism or extremism. Like, that's not a desired outcome. At the same time, ISIS uses Wahhabi textbooks in their schools because it just, like, works. There's enough in common that they can make it work. So it's hard to walk this blurred line between these nonviolent and violent applications. I'll unmute myself. One related question, uh, looking at Nigeria, maybe uh, Kritika, you and Bruce could both speak to that. This is another example of kind of long-term repercussions. It really struck me in the book that, that one of the most infamous Salafist movements in recent years has been the Boko Haram of Northeastern Nigeria that a lot of people listening will, will know about, notorious for the kidnapping of the Chivak schoolgirls and responsible for years of bloodshed. Uh, but I had not realized the extent to which there was a Saudi connection there as well, and, and maybe speak to that and, and, and how that came to be. Um, so Nigeria was one of the first countries that Saudi Arabia um, highlighted as a possible subject of proselytization all the way back in 1965, so shortly after Nigeria's independence from Great Britain. Um, it was obviously home to a huge Muslim population. It was a you know, post-colonial nation. There were a lot of Muslims, especially in the North. So the first, um, you know, starting 1965, Saudi Arabia started to send scholarships there and cultivate this class of Salafis. This became successful pretty fast. Within 10 years, by the 1970s, there was a really powerful Salafi movement in um, Northern Nigeria called Izala. And I did see a question about Salafi versus Wahhabi. I will definitely clarify that right after this. Salafi is basically a, a puritanical kind of Islam that seeks to return to the earliest uh, first three generations of Muslims. So it's pretty austere and they tend to dress in a distinctive way and emphasize directly and literally reading the Quran. So starting in the 1970s up until the early millennium, there was this very vocal, powerful, influential Salafi movement in northern Nigeria. The most charismatic Salafi of the 21st century in Nigeria was this guy called Jafar Adam, who studied in Medina on the scholarship and was a very influential preacher. I mean, he was like a rock star. He drew thousands of people to his sermons. One of the people who became his protege uh, was this guy called Muhammad Yusuf, who founded a group called Boko Haram. So the dynamic in Nigeria was it started pretty innocuously with scholarships. Then it became kind of a grassroots phenomenon of this Salafi movement. And then it kept breaking off and breaking off and breaking off. Then it became this kind of more extreme Sunni Salafi group. Then it became Boko Haram. And Boko Haram itself wasn't violent uh, until about 2009 when their leader was assassinated. So then Boko Haram turned into this 
very violent jihadist phenomenon. So what we see in Nigeria is a typical case of, you know, letting, opening this can of worms that Saudi Arabia did, could not have possibly expected in the 1960s when they started giving scholarships. But the fact is that Salafism was so influential and attractive in Nigeria that it made a base of millions of people in just about four decades. And it completely transformed that country's religious landscape. Bruce, do you want to speak to that? What's what you saw? Yeah, let me let me add uh, this to um, that. It's very important to see the role of individuals in the Saudi decision-making process over time. Um, and while Saudi Arabia has been proselytizing its own form of Islam, Wahhabism, ever since its founding, um, it really is the 19, early 1970s, the oil boom, uh, the Arab-Israeli War of 1973 that leads to the quadrupling of, of oil prices, that provides the, uh, the money to do it. But it's an interesting question. If, Kaisel, if Faisal had not been on the throne, would it have been done in quite the same way? Uh, Faisal um, was a very pious uh, Saudi, a true believer, he was open to some elements of reform. He began the first uh, education for women in the kingdom come on his time. But he was a true believer in the export of Wahhabist Islam. And you see that in his time, this massive cranking up uh, of money, but also organizational activity. Uh, he also traveled extensively. And in the process of traveling extensively, uh, he would often found mosques in various countries around the world. I'll, I'll give you one example uh, from my personal experience. Uh, we used to live in Brussels. Uh, right across the street from us uh, was the, still is, the largest mosque in Brussels. It had actually not been built as a mosque to start with. It was built as part of a centennial anniversary exhibition in Brussels to show you different things around the world so it was one of the exhibits. Well, Faisal went to Brussels right after the 1973 oil uh, embargo, uh, and the government of Belgium wanted to show how happy they were that he'd come and to see if maybe they could get a little bit of a break on their oil prices. So they gave the mosque to him. It's since been um, filled with Saudi preachers who come from the kingdom and who brought their militant form of Islam to uh, Brussels. Well, it turned out five or ten years ago when we had the attacks in Paris and Brussels that it was precisely from this mosque that those people have been inculcated into the kind of Islam. So without Faisal, you might not have had the extraordinary burst that we've seen since then, which of course brings me uh, to today, uh, to King Salman. Um, King Salman for 50 years before he was uh, first crown prince and then king, uh, was governor of the province of Riyadh, where the capital of the country is. Uh, in the Afghan war of the 1980s, when the US and Saudi Arabia were the quartermasters of the Mujahideen, uh, Salman had his own role to play. He was in charge of raising private funds to go to the Mujahideen. And for the first three or four years of the Afghan war, Salman actually raised far more money than the CIA and the Saudi intelligence service were putting in. He, in many ways, funded the start of the Afghan war. Well, he would go on to be a key player in the Bosnia war. He was a big funder of that, too. Um, so the current king uh, is very much uh, part of the whole apparatus. And it's an excellent example of how the public and private in Saudi Arabia get blurred when you get into this business of proselytization. Yes, he was the governor of Riyadh, so he had an official position, but he was raising private money from other Saudi princes and rich Saudi businessmen, which was private money. Where you can draw the distinction between the government of Saudi Arabia and the uh, private sector uh, is very, very hard to do, particularly as the royal family 
is the government. And there's no, there's no distinction in the minds of Saudi princesses, princes between them and the government. It's all one thing for them. And of course, speaking of the, of the family and the government, you've got Mohammed bin Salman, the, the, the crown prince. And this, I mean, the, the, Credit I noticed earlier the question about the, the making the distinction between Wahhabism and uh, Salafism. And, and one way to get at it, we can look at sort of what his role is today. And, and, and of course, he's presented himself, the, the, the young de facto ruler today, as a champion of reform, of opening theaters, new opportunities for women. He's also believed complicit in the murder of Washington Post columnist uh, Jamil, Jamal Khashoggi and the major backer of the war in, in Yemen and opposition to Iran more generally. Uh, so one question is, is he a Wahhabi? And to, to what extent that is? And then looking at the, the, the influence of Wahhabism historically going back many years in, in Saudi Arabia. Uh Yes, he is a Wahhabi. If you're a Saudi royal, you are a Wahhabi. Uh, that's categorical. Um, so what is Wahhabism? Wahhabism is the state religion of Saudi Arabia. It started in the 18th century when there was a preacher named uh, Muhammad ibn Abd al-Wahhab, who gave his name to this movement, uh, who was very against some of the idolatrous practices that he saw in the peninsula, um, like going to shrines and, uh, you know, celebrating the prophet's birthday and kind of just taking liberties with the religion. He was kind of like Martin Luther in that way, um, you know, many asterisks on the comparison, but that's kind of the way he was going. He wanted to reform and purify the religion and go back to the book. So in the late 18th century, um, Wahhab was a very popular preacher across desert Arabia, signed a pact with the Saudi royal family that said, uh, I will give you religious leg legitimacy for your rule if you protect me and my preachers. So they shook on it. And to this day, the Saudi royal family, which includes Mohammed bin Salman, upholds that pact and supports the Wahhabi clerical establishment in Saudi Arabia. So Wahhabism is Saudi religion, Saudi Islam. Um, Salafism, by the way, is different. It, Salaf means the, the earliest Muslims, the first three generations of Muslims. Salafism and Wahhabism have a lot in common in practice, but they are different because Salafism started in 20th century Egypt, and it was kind of an anti-colonial movement to reject European and Western imperialism by going back to Islam instead of kind of these secular national nation building projects. In practice, um, Saudi proselytization creates Salafis instead of Wahhabis because Wahhabism is so site specific. It's so related to the House of Saud. It's so related to being a Saudi citizen um, that, you know, in practice, it creates Salafis abroad. They are two different things, but they have a lot in common. In the 20th century, they found a lot in common. Um, in terms of MBS today, he is a Wahhabi, but uh, in he, you know, has this Vision 2030 program to modernize the kingdom, diversify its economy away from oil. And in the 13 priorities listed on the Vision 2030 blueprint from 2016, only one of them relates in any way to religion. And that's only the Hajj and Umrah. And that's only because it's a big part of the economy. Uh, so he has said, also he said in Western media, we're gonna stamp out extremism. We are gonna return to moderate Islam. Uh, we're gonna do it within one generation. We're gonna do it tomorrow. So he's clearly sensitive about the image that Saudi Arabia has developed as spreading terrorism abroad. That being said, as Bruce has said, and as is Bruce has quoted in my book, he is one of the most <laughs> virulent anti-Shia ideologues um, in you know modern Saudi history. And he, stokes this kind of Iranian rivalry. He's called the Ayatollah Khomeini Hitler, worse than Hitler. You know, he's, he's not a bastion of tolerance. So he is still a Wahhabi. I would say he's probably directing a little bit less money to this proselytization thing. And that's, you know, that's fine. It's a neutral fact. People who worked in the Dawah ministry have said since MBS came to power, they have had slightly fewer resources. He's made some high profile appointments who speak this kind of modern language. So the new head of the Muslim World League charity, which is a very influential Muslim charity headquartered in Mecca, Dr. Al-Issa, uh, he's a 
remarkable kind of rhetoric, whether it's sincere or not, he has acknowledged the Holocaust and how bad it was to an audience of Jews in New York, which, you know, is, is kind of unbelievable in a Saudi context. He goes to a lot of conferences with names like moderation and finding the true Islam and stuff like that. Um, it sometimes is an awkward new tone, but they are trying to change the tone of their project. And the Vision 2030 branding at least has reached as far as Indonesia. When I went to the Saudi University in Jakarta, which is pretty amazing, it's a branch of a Riyadi University, completely in Arabic. It was covered in Vision 2030 materials. And the Saudi ambassador told me that he's also an ambassador of Vision 2030. So whether they're just talking the talk for now, that's all we can say, they are talking the talk, as for whether it has real effects, we're gonna have to keep watching it. Um, so I would say, you know, in summary, yes, Vision 2030 is changing the Saudi Dawa project. They are conscious of their image, uh, at least MBS is. We don't know how long he'll be there, but as long as he's there, they are conscious of the image. It's important to keep them accountable whether there are actual changes on the ground in terms of money allocated. Um, and most importantly, um, his crackdown on extremism has been not a crackdown on intolerance because he promotes anti-Shia ideologues and considers one of them to be like almost like his father. He, the, the clerics that he locks up are the ones who um, talk about human rights or have refused to fall into line with his agenda. So in terms of him reforming the Wahhabi establishment, it's not so much that he's reforming their excesses of theology, but trying to get them into line. Uh, into kind of like absolute obedience to him. So it's important not to take everything that MBS says at face value. I think a lot of us have learned that already. It was obvious for many of us from the start, but definitely after the Khashoggi affair, it's obvious you cannot take everything that they say about Vision 2030 at face value. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I think some of the changes, the cosmetic changes, if they do filter down, and if Saudi Islam does change what that means, that's a positive development and we should, as a global community, encourage that. This is a, a question we had from, I'm sure I'm on mute, yes. The question we have from Rhea that sort of uh, goes back to the a more historical question, 1979, the siege of Mecca. Uh, to what extent, and this is something that Bruce, I'm sure you could speak to as well, to what extent was that a turning point of some kind for the Dawa project? Um, the, and if so, why? Uh, I will definitely see the floor of Bruce in a minute, but 1979 was absolutely, whoever sent the question hit the nail on the head, that was the turning point for this project. 1979 was not just the siege of Mecca, for those in the audience, it was when this like group of Saudi rebels inside Saudi Arabia occupied the Grand Mosque and accused the royal family of being insufficiently Islamic, which was like a crazy thing to happen. Um, and then uh, also 1979 was when the Iranian revolution happened, which was this kind of like Shia revolutionary government, which was in many ways very threatening to the Saudi monarchy, which is an absolute monarchy. So 1979, both of these things happened and they really ramped up the Dawah. So 1980s was the peak Dawah decade. Um, 1980 was when the Saudi university opened in Jakarta. 1980s was when the scholarships in Nigeria really skyrocketed. 1980s, they even started giving scholarships to Yugoslavia before Kosovo and Bosnia were even countries. So 1979 was absolutely, it struck fear into their hearts and they really ramped it up. Um, and Bruce, maybe you can comment more on what the impact of that year was. Certainly, and, and you're absolutely right. 1979 is the pivotal year. It's the trifecta. You have the takeover of the mosque uh, and the people who took over the mosque were well known to the Saudi clerical leadership. In fact, many of these people had been uh, nurtured by the Saudi clerical leadership all these for many, many years. And here, all of a sudden, they've turned against him, taken over the mosque, uh, and the Saudis had to call in foreigners in order to take the mosque back. Specifically, they had to go to the French, who brought in some commandos who, using chemical weapons, were able to retake the, the mosque. It was a searing experience. It was also the year of the Iranian Revolution. It was also the year that the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. So all these things came together and encouraged the royal family to now move 
very much into the proselytization business against two enemies, um, communism and Shiism. There is a little bit of a mythology, and MBS pushes this mythology, that kind of portrays Saudi Arabia pre-1979 as this almost uh, hedonistic society with movie theaters and uh, girls running around in short skirts. Uh, I think that, I don't think that happened. Saudi Arabia was a very conservative society pre-1979. Yes, it got more conservative post-1979, uh, but the, the notion that they went from light to dark um, is, I think, a, a fiction of history. Um, it serves the purposes of someone like MBS who wants to make the argument, we're just returning to the old ways. But I, I say it again, it's, it's um, an exaggeration. But it's no question that this was a crucial formative event, particularly for the then Crown Prince, Crown Prince Fahd, uh, who was by no means the epitome of a Wahhabi um, pious person. He was known for uh, drunkenness. He was known for gambling. Uh, he loved spending time on the Riviera. Um, 1979, uh, he reinvented himself. He's the Saudi king who first begins to use as common term custodian of the two holy mosques because he needed to in effect, change his image from playboy to uh, the custodian of the two holy mosques, the protector of Islam. And all of that flows uh, from the 1979 period. You know, 1979 being you know, such an important year for U.S. policy uh, in the Middle East and beyond as well, uh, it, it might be a good moment to have the, the question, one of our polls, uh, Holly, on the high watermark and U.S.-Saudi relationships or looking back over the last 30 or 40 years. And if we could maybe put that one up to get the sense of the folks um, listening in, you know, under which president was the relationship strongest, closest? I mean, George H.W. Bush, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, or Donald Trump? And it would just take a moment to answer that question. Then I think get, get uh, Gretica and, and, and uh, Bruce uh, to speak to that, not only historically, when, 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 when and why the relationship was strongest, but where we are today in the Trump administration, where we're likely to be, uh, given the coronavirus, all the economic consequences from that. So we'll count down five, four, three, two, one, and we'll see what we came up with. Uh, so we've got George H.W. Bush, 60%, and, and by the three to one plurality margin, the sort of George W. Bush, 20, Rock 2, Donald Trump 19. It's interesting that Trump would get that. Gretica, do you want to speak first or? Uh, is Bruce still here? Yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Uh, I think this is a good question. And well, I think the correct answer is that Barack Obama was definitely the lowest. Um, in my view, George W. Bush was the strongest um, in recent memory uh, because after 9-11, the U.S.-Saudi counterterrorism partnership really intensified and all eight years of his very long presidency involved very close cooperation with Saudi, including Operation Desert Storm and so on. Um, and Donald Trump, of course, uh, has a very close relationship with Saudi too. His very first state visit abroad was to Saudi Arabia. He signed off on one of the biggest... Saudi arms deals in recent memory. Um, so, and yeah, but Barack Obama, it should be said, was the most skeptical of this special relationship that began under FDR. He really tried to pivot away uh, or not frame it on such positive terms. He's criticized Saudi um, human rights issues. He even spoke in Indonesia about uh, Saudi Arabia's influence on the Islam of that country, which of course he spent several years of his childhood living in. So I think everyone's kind of on the money. All, th all three presidents except Obama did have very strong relationships with, uh, with Saudi Arabia. Let me say a few words about the Trump administration. Um, 
yes, Trump has endorsed Saudi Arabia like no American president has ever endorsed Saudi Arabia before. Uh, he, he went there his first foreign trip. Uh, we have the iconic uh, picture of him, King Salman, and the Egyptian president standing around the glowing orb. Uh, I think that picture will outlive uh, almost anything else from uh, the Trump-Saudi relationship. But on his watch, we've also seen the Saudi relationship um, go into a really bad period uh, with the American population as a whole. Um, the Khashoggi incident was pivotal in all this. Uh, the brutal murder of a Washington Post correspondent inside a Saudi consulate um, with uh, uh, the body being dismembered at the end, and still we don't know what's happened to it. But it was already building because of the Yemen war. Um, many Americans, particularly Democrats, but also some Republicans, increasingly saw the Yemen war as not just a quagmire and a very expensive quagmire that's costing the Saudis billions of dollars, uh, but a real humanitarian disaster, which has put more than half the Yemeni population uh, dependent upon uh, food aid from outside and led to mass malnutrition, uh, all of which is rightly blamed on Mohammed bin Salman. This is his war. Uh, he, he dreamed this idea up. Um, and it's rebounded back onto Trump. And now, with oil prices, we find that the Republicans are dropping off the Saudis uh, like crazy, too. Uh, they blame the Saudis uh, for the collapse in world oil prices. That's really unfair. Uh, it's the crops and demand that's led to the collapse in oil prices. But because the Saudis initially pursued a price war with Russia, uh, they're kind of guilty by omission of not trying to resolve this problem sooner. Well, Republican congressmen and senators from states like North Dakota, uh, Texas, uh, Oklahoma, where fracking is very important, uh, they're now seeing thousands, tens of thousands of people who are their natural core constituency put out of work. And who are they blaming? The Saudis. Senator Ted Cruz, one of the most loyal Trump supporters of them all, uh, went out of his way to attack the Saudi ambassador a couple of weeks ago. Um, and tell her, as he subsequently said to the press, if you act like an enemy, you can be damn sure you will be treated as an enemy. All of which raises the point, what happens if Trump loses in November and you get a Democratic administration which is no longer so endeared of working with the Saudis? I think there's a real possibility of an existential threat to this relationship, particularly if oil prices are still in the teens uh, the obvious question is, what do we need them for? There's so much oil out there. We don't need to be nice anymore. It'll be an interesting thing to see uh, if uh, Joe Biden is elected in November. And Critica, what do you think that means for the, for the, the idea of the call for Saudi's you know, view of its own mission in the world? I mean, if they are marginalized economically, if, 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 if they're in the way that Bruce is just describing, through in a future where we're not, where the Hajj is much less of an of a, of a, uh, important moment in the, in the life of Muslims worldwide, the identification with Saudi Arabia. Does this just, do they just fade away and we look back and this era is gone and, and, and somebody else, Iran, other countries, I mean, sort of emerge as, as are, 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 the in, are the indigenous groups in places like Nigeria and Indonesia sort of come into their own? What, what do you see happening? Um, I think something that's going to happen in which the pandemic is probably accelerating is the emergence of a multipolar Islamic world, which again is not new. It's kind of what it was like for hundreds of years up until the 20th century. Um, you know, at various times there have been some caliphates that bossed or the Ottoman Empire that have been the most powerful Muslim polity, but you know, it's always been a multipolar world. And in the 21st century, we've seen a number of other Gulf countries, UAE, Qatar, Kuwait, all emerge with their own Dawa projects. So, you know, as you said, as the pandemic has made the Hajj less important and probably will for some years to come, we've also started to see 
opposition from other Muslim leaders, calls to boycott the Hajj, either because of Yemen or because of perceived human rights abuses. Even Ilhan Omar has in the past called for boycotting the Hajj. Um, if the Hajj declines in prestige, and the Saudi brand has been declining in prestige for most of the century, we're just gonna see a, a multipolar world where Saudi Arabia is just simply not you know, as important. It'll still be the birthplace of Islam, of course. It'll sp still be the direction in which Muslims pray every day, but it's no longer gonna be the you know, sole player. And any country that tries to mount its own projects in this century, it's my opinion that none will be quite as influential in gestalt as the Saudi project has been, because there was such a unique combination of factors there, like their historical claim to the birthplace of the religion and their unusually high level of oil wealth. So I would be very surprised if another country mounted quite the same kind of global effort. Um, Turkey, for example, is really trying to extend its soft power through the Balkans, which makes sense because it was, you know, Ottoman territories and in Africa, but they don't have that kind of money that Saudi did in the 70s. So I really don't think we're going to see anything like the Saudi project in the Muslim world ever again. Iran, of course, is not a contender at all um, at this point in that state. They're dealing with domestic uh, issues first and foremost, and then their backyard second. So I don't think we're ever going to see anything like the Saudi call again. And even that, uh, as you know, as we're seeing, is really on the decline. So we're, we're about to we're about out of time, but I just had one, one, one last question from the audience. Uh, this is from, goes back to sort of the religious project. Uh, it's from former reporting fellow, Pulitzer reporting fellow, A.J. Nada uh, from Davidson College. Uh, he asked, how have the Saudi proselytizers rationalized the Quranic verse, there is no compulsion in religion? And did you come across that in your research at all? Yeah, it's a great question. There there really is no compulsion in the Saudi Dawa project. It's very incentive based. I don't think I've ever met anyone who was forced to do anything in Indonesia, Nigeria, or Kosovo by Saudi Arabia. In Kosovo, they found a post-war population with no opportunities and almost ineffectual passport and gave out you know, hundreds of scholarships to get a world-class university education. Um, in, in Indonesia, they found this very large population of Muslims whose government was aggressively secular, had no place for them, and you know, gave them free schools, free orphanages, and offered them to, to offer to teach them Arabic, which most people in Indonesia who are Muslim want to learn anyway. It's the language of the Quran. Same story in Nigeria, it's a post-colonial country. Um, religion, religion's always been a contentious field there. This country is gonna come and offer you all these things. So it's a two-way street. I don't think there was compulsion in the Saudi project, uh, regardless of its effects. It was very incentive-based, and it also builds upon this like very strong grassroots feeling, uh, positive feeling in a lot of countries towards Saudi Arabia. Um, in Indonesia today, like leaving Dawa aside, just Saudi is such a powerful brand. It's like having an American flag on something. I have bought Saudi branded Q-tips. What does that have to do with Saudi? Like nothing. It's just like, it sells. People love it. You can go to any shop and buy things branded with a Kaaba. So, you know, it's a, it's a good question, but I actually think that they made their ideology so attractive through other means, often material things, not spiritual things, that it that that's why the project was successful because they had these things to concrete things to offer not just like gloom and doom so you know as you said as i just said the the idea that there's no compulsion in religion is is one of the central um tenets in islam you shouldn't force anyone to convert and i think on both sides people would say we didn't force anyone to do anything okay well on that note i want to thank you both uh, for a really fascinating discussion and a, and a terrific book uh, I want to thank the audience for your interest and for your questions, and my colleagues at the Pulitzer Center, especially Holly Pippenberg, our producer, for this session. Uh, if you just stay with us for a few moments longer, remember we'll have a brief survey uh, after we'll pop up as soon as we officially end this session. Uh, we also want, want to let you know that the next talks at Pulitzer will be with Amy Maxman uh, this Friday, May 1st, uh, talking about coronavirus testing and her work more broadly on global health. Uh, please join us again and uh, feel free to share widely information about uh, this session or future talks at Pulitzer. Uh, and remember that we are a nonprofit journalism organization 
And as such, we very much depend on your on support from donors. Uh, more on our reporting, upcoming events, and how you can support the Pulitzer Center at PulitzerCenter.org. Uh, so with that, thank you again uh, for your support and for being with you, us today, and especially to um, Kritika Varga and Bruce Rydell. Thank you all.